Hi and welcome to today's live reading from Landing the Lawman by Katie Scott, presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Chapter 1 The low pitch of an angry male voice carried all the way to the elevator, eclipsing even the sound of smooth jazz piping in from the speakers over Carter Hill's head in the elevator. Despite the gruff tone to that low rumble, Carter smiled. After several years of working with a man as one of his top consultants in hydrology and water rights management cases, and even having become friends, she accepted it as a bright spot of day when she got to mess with him. Damn it, where the hell is she? No doubt Logan meant her. Carter glanced at her phone. Not that she was late. In fact, she had arrived at the law offices of Courtier and Browning with two minutes to spare. However, Logan always got like this during a trial. She'd seen it happen every time he hired her. Maybe I shouldn't have insisted on watching that movie last Friday. At least she'd given him the weekend to concentrate, though. Otherwise, he'd be way worse right now. She paused at Mrs. Landingham's desk. As always, Logan's executive assistant had her salt and pepper hair scraped back in a severe bun. In combination with a grey suit, no makeup, and unsmiling countenance, the woman was intimidating at best. She was also the most efficient person Carter had ever met, and Logan's moods didn't put a dent in her rawhide exterior. As soon as she spied Carter, Mrs. Landingham stood from behind her desk, coming around, not to greet her, but to open the door. Shall I? Please go in, Mrs. Landingham practically shoved her into the room, closing the door behind her with a decidedly put-upon snap. The man standing behind the desk jerked his head up from a stack of papers, recognition flickering in his hard, dark eyes for a minuscule moment before thick, black brows descended into a scribble. He opened his mouth, no doubt to ream her, but Carter beat him to the punch, sending him a sugary smile, you bellowed? She blinked at him in innocent curiosity, biting back a laugh as his brows practically met in the middle. Carter had to admit she loved those brows. They kept Logan's face, all symmetrical, with chiselled angles and a surprisingly full mouth, from falling into the realm of too pretty. Plus, they were practically a telegraph of his thoughts. His gaze skated down her person and his frown deepened the lines bracketing his mouth going deeper. Carter bit back a shiver of awareness with a mental broom, a sensation she'd had to contend with more and more recently. When they'd met, she was dating Brian, then engaged. So friendship had been the only thing on offer. She'd broken off her engagement a while ago, though. So what the heck? Why awareness for her friend now? She had no idea of the timing. The why was pretty obvious. Logan was just too damn good looking for her own good. When she'd been off the market, she'd registered Logan's sex appeal. After all, she wasn't dead. But that was it. Merely a general appreciation. Maybe her problem that he was currently the only man in her life. Not that she had any intention of going there. She knew Logan Cartes well enough to be painfully aware that he was not remotely interested in a romantic relationship with anyone, not after the number his ex did on him. Carter's breakup looked like a birthday party in comparison. If she ever met Angela Hayes in person, Carter might do something unladylike and punch the woman in the nose. No one ever said Carter was a lady anyway, even though her mother had tried her best. Regardless, Logan hadn't once, in all the time they'd known each other, sent even an inkling of sexual attraction in her direction. Not even a smouldering smidge of it. The few times she'd encountered him with another woman, he'd had supermodel types with him. Never the same woman, and he never, ever talked about dating. While Carter was aware that she'd been blessed with the hell dark colouring and general good looks, she was also a cowgirl at heart. Even her job in hydrology and water management involved a lot of time in boots, hiking all over all sorts of terrain. Sure, when she was in the city, she liked to dress up, but a supermodel, she was not. 
Besides, she knew herself well enough to realise she was white picket fence all the way, and Logan was not. Not to mention, he was one of her only friends in Austin. No way was she about to ruin that with an unrequited crush. Therefore, she'd gotten good at ignoring her gut instinct. Something she did now, pushing the tingling awareness behind her amusement, at the prospect of vaguely tangling with him. You're late, he snapped. I'm right on time. He glanced at the crystal-cased clock that sat on his pristine mahogany bookcases. The only directive item in the room if she discounted the law degrees and accolades framed on the walls. Otherwise, he didn't have a single personal item in the beautifully appointed room with its polished wooden furniture and floor-to-ceiling windows letting in lots of natural light. No pictures of family or even a squeeze ball. Heaven knew the man could use some kind of stress relief. Maybe she'd get him a squeeze ball for his birthday. Something goofy to lighten up things in here. She flicked an uninterested glance at the clock. You set it ten minutes early, she reminded him dryly. Just like all the clocks in your apartment. He lifted a single eyebrow. What? You didn't think I'd notice, she smirked. Sort of like you didn't think I'd notice the buttery handprint you left on my leather couch Friday night. Busted, Carter winced. Sorry about that. I hoped it would just dry up and disappear. Bill me for the cleaning. He waved the suggestion off and dropped his gaze back to the papers he was shuffling into his pristine and no doubt ridiculously expensive leather briefcase. The man had a thing with leather. Carter dropped into the upholstered armchair in front of the desk, careful not to wrinkle her brand new tailored suit. She would have preferred the gorgeous deep red number she tried on a few weekends ago. The one with the peplum trim to the jacket that made her waist appear smaller and gave her a sexy edge. Except, Logan wanted black suits only for court. Pantsuits, more specifically, which meant she didn't even get to dress it up with a skirt. The more austere, the better, as far as he was concerned, as evidenced by his own attire. For a woman who traipsed around in jeans and boots most of the time, Carter loved a good chance to dress up. Too bad this wasn't it. Taking advantage of having Logan's focus elsewhere, Carter studied the man in front of her. Tall and lean, even the cut of his impeccable black suit couldn't hide his broad shoulders and muscled tone. He arose at the butt crack of dawn to work out. Given his drive, she was shocked he didn't run a marathon every single day. If she didn't already know that Logan was city-bred from the top of his short black hair to the bottom of his shiny black shoes, she'd have pegged him as a cowboy. He had the whip lean build to him and walked with a bit of a swagger. Even his cologne reminded her of home, subtle and outdoorsy and flagrantly male. However, in the time she'd known him, she had yet to see him step foot on a ranch or a farm, even to do his interviews. Usually he brought people into his office for those. Logan finished organising things to his exacting standards, then picked up his briefcase and looked at her. Ready? Carter pushed to her feet and had to hide a wince. What's wrong with you? Logan demanded. Damn, he caught that? Carter shrugged. Nothing that a long soak in my jacuzzi bath won't fix. He paused and stared at her with an inscrutable expression that meant he was waiting for more. Carter sighed. I visited home this weekend and rode me west for the first time in forever. I'm still feeling it in my behind. She gave her touche a smack. Of course you named your horse Mae West, he muttered, which only made Carter snicker. She was always quoting the actress. Hey, don't knock her. The woman has some of the best life advice for women. You once answered the door and asked if I was happy to see you or if I had a pistol in my pocket. The dry tone to his voice only had her cracking up more. That's a good one. I don't see how that's advice. Well, you wouldn't. The man was pulled tighter than a kinch on a saddle. Excuse me? He paused, opening the door for her. You need to let loose and live a little. I'm perfectly happy with my life, he said, with all the emotion of a wet blanket. You're round up like a pocket watch, 
I never say you put a foot wrong, but you don't have any fun that way either. To quote me, to err is human. She reached up to pat his cheek, but it feels divine. If Carter didn't know better, she would have sworn those ebony eyes of his dropped to her lips, just for a second. Too quick for her to be certain, which was silly. This stupid, very temporary crush was messing with her brain. They were co-workers and friends, nothing more. Even if she'd made it a bit of a mission in life to make him have fun. I've had my share of failures, he said, and learned all the wrong lessons in my opinion. Only one failure in Logan's life that she was aware of, and the experience of his fiance walking out of him to be with another man, claiming it was all his fault, thanks to his obsession with his career, had cut deep. I wasn't asking for your opinion, Logan practically grilled. No surprise there. He always got that way when Angela was brought up, or even remotely hinted at. Beggars can't be choosers. She gave a sassy grin and walked past him with a quick thanks for holding the door. They paused at the elevator and Carter ignored the glowering man at her side to enjoy the view out of the floor-to-ceiling window behind, behind the elevator. Sparkling glass of the buildings around them reflected in the blue skies of a perfect Texas spring day. Beyond the buildings, the Colorado River created what the locals called Town Lake, with its wide bridges, dark waters and the bright greens of newly leafed grass trees along its banks. The Austin skyline had changed dramatically in the last 15 years, with the addition of skyscrapers and urban living. Carter had opted for an apartment on the other side of the I-35, still within walking distance of the bars and restaurants downtown, but not quite as claustrophobic. After growing up with wide open spaces, the metropolis of the Texas state capital, though small compared to San Antonio, Houston or Dallas, had still been overwhelming. I liked the red one better. Carter whipped round at the sound of Logan's voice, which had come off as strangely hostile. Sorry? she asked. What was he talking about? The red suit. He turned his face to stare at the elevator number as it changed. I liked it better. Carter stared at him like a catfish caught on a fishing line, mouth wide open. How on earth did you know about that? Social media. Social? She couldn't get the words out because she was too busy coughing over the image of the man in front of her doing anything on social media, let alone bothering to follow her feed. Friends or not. Carter plonked one hand on her hip, tipping her head back to give him a cockeyed stare. Logan Cartes, are you social media stalking me? That earned her a flat-lipped lawyer stare. No. The elevator arrived, already half-filled, and he waved her inside. In a quieter voice, she kept vaguely poking at him. Then why do you know about? You friended me. He glanced over his shoulder at the others in the elevator with him. That was true. He had been one of her only acquaintances in the area at the time. She'd been shot when he'd accepted, but otherwise assumed he didn't do social media. I keep tabs on everyone I do business with. The small buzz at the thought of him checking her out on social media fizzed out flatter, faster than flat champagne. Of course he kept tabs on everything working with him. He'd want to make sure people like her, who he used for expert analysis and testimony, were unimpeachable. Smart. She did her best to keep Dan one word neutral. He nodded. You told me you like suits, black suits with pants. He turned his head to look at her finally, dark eyes skating over her again, just as he'd done when she showed up in his office. This one is fine. With a metaphorical shovel, she buried the skitter of awareness un- under a pile of reality. 